Thank you, Brother Maxie. It is indeed a privilege to be a part of this lectureship program. I stand before you as a part of a grateful brotherhood for the wonderful work that is being done by the Brown Trail School of Preaching, by the Brown Trail Church. Uh, in our day and time, it is so refreshing and encouraging to know that men are being trained to be preachers and proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we are so very grateful for that. It is privilege enough just to be on the stage with the three men who were sitting up here a few moments ago. Uh, all three of them I hold in the highest of esteem and deep regard in my heart. They have been a tremendous influence in my life over the past seven years since I have uh, moved out west and have had the privilege of getting to know them. And uh, I, I don't have a better friend in the world than Tommy Haynes. Uh, when my family and I left the Holy Land of Alabama about uh, seven years ago, uh, we moved to Oklahoma to do foreign mission work. And uh, I'm convinced that God allows certain people to come into our lives at certain times. And Tommy Haynes came into my life and has been a wonderful brother and encourager and friend. We've spent countless hours um, praying together and studying the Word of God preaching together on television. We uh, spend a lot of time eating together. The only thing in all of the time that we've uh, found in the seven years that we would disagree with one another about, even in regard to the study of the Word of God, the only thing that we disagree about is what is real, true barbecue. Uh, I come from the southeast where we eat real barbecue, and he's from Texas where they eat steak and call it barbecue. <laughs> so uh, we, that's the only thing that we... Uh, disagree about. I believe we could search the world over and not find a more gracious host than Brother Maxi Boren and how grateful we are for his kindness. Uh, two or three things I've noticed in the few years that I've been attending this lectureship with Tommy since he brought me up. Uh, Brother Maxi is always a gracious host. He always has kind things to say. Every speaker that I've heard in the time I've been coming, Brother Boren gets up and always uh, talks about what a great job he did and what a tremendous lesson that was. Uh, he's kinder than I would have been sometimes, I'll have to admit, but uh, <laughs> if he doesn't say it this time, I f will feel really bad about it, but uh, <laughs> he, he is so very kind. And we've been so impressed with the balance that is portrayed in this lectureship in a day of extremes. We desperately need a uh, balance, and so we're very grateful for that. <coughs> And we've been so impressed with uh, the kindness of so many and the warmth and the friendliness of this congregation. Brother um, Maxie mentioned that he was Tommy's Paul in the faith, and I kid Tommy about being so much older than me. Brother Maxie, he is my Paul in the faith. And so uh, he's really not that much older than me, but I, I kid him about that. Well, it's a joy to be with you this afternoon. In the introduction to his classic work entitled All the Promises of the Bible, Dr. Herbert Lockyer tells about a school teacher from Canada by the name of Everett Storms. Professor Storms decided after reading the Bible for 27 years straight that he would do something a little bit different. He decided that it, he would count all of the promises that were found in the pages of the Word of God. What a monumental task. It took him a year and a half, but after a year and a half, Professor Storms concluded that there was found in the pages of the Word of God nearly 9,000 promises in the Bible. 9,000 promises. He said that of all of those promises, there were promises that were made by one man to another man. There were promises that were made by men to God. There were promises that were made by, uh, there were a couple of times an evil spirit made a promise to the Lord. But the vast majority of those promises, more than 7,000 of those promises, were promises that God made to man. More than 7,000 promises. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but that ought to excite us to know that we serve a God who has made more than 7,000 promises to his people. And every one of those promises God has either fulfilled at some point in the past or he will fulfill at some point in the future. When the Apostle Peter considered the magnitude of God's promises that had been given and fulfilled through all of the ages of time, and, and no doubt Peter thought about the promises in his own life, when Peter wrote these words, he probably was thinking about Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. When Jesus had said to, them, to him, I say unto you that you are Peter, 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter probably remembered a time in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 when Jesus said, there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. And Peter probably recalled how that promise, those promises were fulfilled in his life when he stood up with the 11 in Acts chapter 2 and he proclaimed the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And so with all of that in Peter's heart and with all of that in his mind, he could say nothing but what we have recorded in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4 when he said these are exceeding great and precious promises. Dr. Lockyer's study of the promises of God led him to say that they are gems and precious stones and pearls of inestimable value in God's cabinet of spiritual jewels which constantly remind the Christian of his true abiding riches. As a very young preacher, very young, nearly 20 years ago, I sat in an assembly and for the very first time, I heard Brother Wendell Winkler preach the Word of God. He said in his lesson based upon the Sermon on the Mount that this sermon is the greatest piece of sermonic material ever spoken or penned. Brother Winkler went on to say, it is unsurpassed in quality and quantity of content. Never has so much been said in such a comparatively short length of space. There is no relationship a person can enter and sustain. There is no moral or spiritual challenge he can face, and there is no mental or emotional need he can experience unless there is a corresponding set of instructions for such to be found in this incomparable, inspired piece of sacred literature. The particular pericope that we are studying today that is a part of the Sermon on the Mount contains three great promises from the lips of our Savior. And as is true with many of the promises in the Bible, each of these three promises contain a condition. If the promise is going to be fulfilled, there is a condition that must be met. Now, I want to suggest to you today that when we read the promises and the conditions of God in the Bible, that they are not based upon the subjective. There is always an objective element involved, and always the objective element is the Word of God. Now, I don't have to tell you today that we live in a day where many people do not like objectivity. There are not a lot of people who want to hear about objectivity or morality or things such as that. I was reading Dear Abby one day, and I want you to know, first of all, that I don't read Dear Abby on a regular basis, but it was lying there open on the table in a moment of weakness. I picked it up. <laughs> Someone wrote in and said, Dear Abby, I'm in love with two women, and neither one of them is my wife. Could you please write and tell me what to do and don't give me any of that objective morality stuff? She wrote back and said, Dear sir, the only difference between humans and animals is that objective morality stuff. And by the way, next time would you please write to a veterinarian? <laughs> the objective element when we think about the promises and the conditions that must be met is always first and foremost the Word of God. Jesus is giving us these promises, and each of these conditions are in the form of present tense verbs. And it indicates a continuation on our part. If we are going uh, to receive, we must keep on asking. If we are going to find, we must keep on seeking. And if we are going to have the door open unto us, we must keep on knocking. Well, let's notice each of these. First of all, ask, and it shall be given to you. When you read the prayers of Jesus, when you read Mark chapter 14, and you see that Jesus prayed and he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and you see Jesus praying over and over and over again, Father, if there's any way that this cup can be removed from me, this cup of suffering, please remove it from me. When you turn to John chapter 16 and 17, and you read the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, which is the real Lord's Prayer of the Bible, you're impressed by the fact that it appears that Jesus is not praying in preparation for the battle, as we sometimes talk about. Sometimes I hear people say that prayer is preparation for the battle, but Jesus does not appear to be praying in preparation for the battle. It appears that Jesus is in the heat of the battle. 
It appears that Jesus is involved in the battle right then. And Jesus, as Tommy pointed out so plainly in the lesson a few moments ago, understood what it meant to, to fight with Satan. He knew what it meant to battle Satan. I suggest to you this morning, this afternoon, that if we really are going to defeat the formidable foe, Satan, we must understand that we are in a war. We are in a battle. And the Bible makes it clear that our battle is not with flesh and blood. It is not with the warfare that we think about. It is not with, with the warfare of mechanical weapons, but it is a warfare of the heart. And we are involved in this spiritual battle with Satan. Jesus call, he is called the great adversary, the serpent, and we are involved in that battle. And I want to suggest to you that there are not many things that frighten Satan. Satan is not frightened by our education. You can have so many degrees behind your name, as one fellow said, that they call you Dr. Fahrenheit. But if, if, it doesn't matter how much education you may have. It doesn't matter what uh, level you have come to in the world of business. It doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter where you are from. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. When we pray, Satan trembles because he is not afraid of my name and he is not afraid of your name, but he is afraid of his name. And when we come before the throne of grace with boldness and ask God to bless us in our time of warfare, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan is afraid. There are many people in our world, including some Christians, who act as if prayer is a magical source for instant gratification. I saw a television commercial not too long ago that attempted to glamorize prayer by advertising a 900 number where you can get someone to pray for you with guaranteed results for only $3. It's my conviction that this is a sign, a small sign of our world's disbelief in the true power of prayer. We don't have to pay for prayer. And we don't have to have somebody else pray for us. As children of God, as we said, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, that we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we might find comfort and help in our time of need. That reminds me of this Acts chapter 12 when Peter had been placed in prison by Herod. And Acts 12, 4 says that earnest prayer was made by Peter or made for Peter by the church. With Peter being chained and surrounded by Roman guards, the request seemed to be impossible. But when Peter was freed by the angel of God and he appeared at the door and he knocked on the door, someone came and opened the answer of the door and they thought that Peter was a ghost. They didn't believe that their prayers would be heard. And if our prayers are filled with doubt and disbelief, James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, that we are defeated already. The point that Jesus is trying to get across to his followers is that God will answer your prayers. When I was a college student a number of years ago, uh, some of us who were involved in student government association uh, in the state of Alabama, we helped uh, one of the men who was running for governor of our state. And he ran on the platform that I will run with an open door policy. And if I am elected governor of the state of Alabama, I will literally take the door off the hinges to the, govern, the governor's office. Well, he won and he did. He took the door off the hinges and he said, anybody who wants to can walk into this office anytime you want to. Now, what he didn't tell you was that you had to get through about 15 other doors and secretaries to get, get in. But if you could get past all of those, you could get into his office. But I want to tell you today that we don't serve a God who has an office that is closed. And the door to his office is always open. And we can come boldly to that throne of grace at any time. Sometimes Jesus is trying to say that God answers all of our prayers. Now, sometimes God's answers do not correlate with our logic like the little boy who couldn't understand why God put so many vitamins in spinach and not more in ice cream. We can't understand why God doesn't answer all of our prayers on our terms the way that we want them answered. But sometimes we are called upon to wait. Jacob waited some 14 years for the wife that he wanted. Sometimes the answer is no. Paul prayed at least on three occasions, and I'm convinced many more times than that, Father, if it is possible, would you please take this thorn in the flesh away from me? But God says, my grace is sufficient for you. In the verses that follow our text, Jesus said that our Father in heaven will give good things to those who ask him. When 
We pray to our Father in heaven. He hears our prayers and he answers them. But it may be only in heaven that some of God's answers or his responses to our prayers are revealed. But all of us who are present this afternoon could look back at times in our life when we know that God answered our prayers. And we can understand exactly what Isaiah had in mind when he wrote in Isaiah 55, verses 7 and 8, that God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your way. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God hears our prayers, and he answers them. The condition that is placed upon this promise is that we should ask. But the question is, for what should we ask? Now, at this point in the message, you could come up with your own list, and it might be quite lengthy, and all of us know that there are many things for which we can ask, but let me mention three or four at this time. I believe, that first of all, it is all right for us to ask God for the temporal blessings of life. Since James tells us in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and is from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We should not be timid in asking God to give us our daily bread. And all of the things that we need to sustain our life, just as Paul said he would in Acts 17 and verse 25. We should pray for the temporal blessings of life. Secondly, we should ask God to bless the church. Many of you who are present this afternoon can remember a time when the house of God was known as a place of prayer. You remember when Wednesday night was called Wednesday night prayer meeting night. I remember as a little boy, my grandfather taking me out to the country on Wednesday night in North Alabama to churches, and he would say, we're going to Wednesday night prayer meeting night. And you know, that's exactly what those brethren did. They spent a lot of time in prayer. Now they studied the Word of God, and they praised God in song as we have done this afternoon, but they spent a great deal of time in prayer. I want to read to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, if you want to be turning there. There's a very familiar passage in verse 14. You've quoted it many times in your own sermons, but I want to begin reading in verse 12. And I want you to look at something maybe we haven't looked at as much as verse 14. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 12, and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among the people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The indication is that God had ordained that this place that Solomon had, that David had worked to see would be built and that Solomon carried out, the indication that God is giving is that this is going to be a house of prayer. He called it a house of sanctification. If you'll read on in verse 15, it says, Now my eyes will be opened and notice this, and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. There is something holy about when we come together as children of God to the house of God to pray. It is a place of sanctification, and it is a place of prayer. And may God forgive those of us who have turned that house of sanctification and prayer into a place of entertainment. May we somehow understand that if we are ever going to approach a holy God that we must develop in our own lives some type of holiness and we must return the house of God from a place of entertainment to a house of prayer and sanctification. We should never make apology for when we come together studying the pure and simple and plain word of God and spending time in prayer and not seeking to have these praise teams and entertainment-oriented worship services and drama productions that seek to tickle the ears of man. But where mankind will approach a holy and complete and perfect God. We should pray for the church. Jesus prayed for the unity of the church in John 17. We ought to pray for the unity of the church, and we should also work diligently to keep that unity, Ephesians 4, 3. You read the letters of the Apostle Paul, and in every letter that he wrote, within the first few verses, Paul says to the church, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. We should pray for the elders in the Lord's church. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, that we're to pray for all who are in authority. 
With so much division and false teaching in the church, elders desperately need our prayers as they guard the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. We ought to pray for the men who are spending time shepherding the church of our Lord. And we need to pray that they will be strong as they stand against those who would allow liberalism to be brought into the church. We need to pray for preachers. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1, Paul said, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Well, is he saying you pray for us that we might be able to gain a lot of wealth? Should you pray for us that we might be more popular? Why? Pray for us that the Word of God might run freely. Pray for us that the Word of God may run swiftly and be glorified in us just as it is in you. We ought to pray for those who are preaching in difficult and foreign places the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And we need to pray, brethren, listen, we need to pray for our brothers in Christ who are gospel preachers who at one time were proclaiming the truth of the gospel who have now left those teachings that they formerly proclaimed. We need to pray that they might return to preaching the word of God in its truth and simplicity. We need to pray that God will bless the church. We ought to ask God to help us in times of need. Jesus taught his disciples that you ought to pray that you do not enter temptation, Mark 14, 38. Again, the writer of Hebrews says, we can come boldly before the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. We ought to ask God to forgive us our sins. Jesus said, you pray, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As God's children, we are to confess our sins and we are to pray, Acts 8, 22, so that the God who stands abundant, ready to abundantly pardon us, Isaiah 55 and verse 7, will forgive. We ought to ask God to heal the sick. Jesus tells us, or James tells us in James 5 and verse 15, that the prayer of the faith will save the sick. And there are numerous examples in the Bible where you have people praying for those who are sick. We should ask God for wisdom. James 1 and 5, James says, If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We need to, wisdom to make the proper decisions in our life. We need wisdom as we think about raising our children. We need wisdom as we think about dealing with difficult situations in the church. We ought to pray and ask God for wisdom. And you can add to the list on and on and on. There are so many things. But the point that we want to make in this study this afternoon is that if we will ask, the Lord will hear our prayers and he will answer them. Secondly, today I want you to note the promise of Jesus that if we will seek, we will find. Brother H. Leo Bowles says that the seeking in this verse expresses the efforts and labors which accompany our prayers. Seeking involves a work on our part. The condition that must be met if we would receive the promise is that we've got something to do. We've got to seek. And again, the question arises, for what should we seek? Let me share with you just three things this afternoon. Number one, we should seek to know the Lord. If you'll turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 3, I want us to look at a number of passages here. You're again familiar very much so with verse 10 where Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Beginning in Philippians 3 and verse 10 through the end of this chapter, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he is talking in this particular section of Scripture about two things primarily. He says there is a goal for the Christian life, and there is a prize at the end of the life, the goal and the prize. Paul says the goal is to come to know Christ. Philippians 3.10, I want to know him. If you'll look down at verse 12, he says, I do not, or verse 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead. There's the goal. Well, what exactly is the goal? Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The goal is to become more and more and more like Jesus. Well, what is the prize? Well, the prize is if we work in our Christian lives to become more and more like Jesus, someday we will be like him. The goal and the prize. Continue reading if you'll look down at verse 20 where Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven. The word citizenship there 
comes from a Greek word. If I'm not mistaken, it is the only time that that particular word is used in the New Testament. And that particular word uh, was used by the people of that day. When people were taken captivity, they were placed on a register. And their names, even though they were citizens, or the, even though they were uh, living in one land, their names had been placed on a register in another land, and they were citizens of that place. And that's the way we are in our life. That's what Paul is saying. Even though we live here on this earth temporarily, our real citizenship is in heaven. Our names have been placed on a register. For when we became children of God, Jesus Christ wrote our name in heaven. We, our names have been placed there. But continue reading. For which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now think about the goal and the prize. The goal is to become like Jesus, but the prize is if we work to become like him, someday we will be like him. And that's what he's saying here in verse 20. One. He will transform our lowly body. The word transform comes from the word metaschematizo. Metaschematizo is the word that we get the word schematic. You know what a schematic is? That is the, the in, internal workings of a machine. It is the inner workings of something. And what Paul is saying is that if we live our lives to become like Christ, there will come a day that he will change us, he will transform us, he will uh, re-schematic us, if you will, so that we will be like him. We spend our lives praying and studying and working to become like him, and someday he will make us like him. And then notice he says that, he will con that we will be conformed to his glorious body. The word conformed there comes from the word uh, sunomorphos. Sumorphos. Sumorphos is the idea uh, that has to do with, with morphing something. My son, a few years ago when he was younger, was reading some books that were, they were called Animorphs. And these books were about um, uh, teenagers who were morphed into uh, some type of creature. They were science fiction books. And uh, that's what the Lord is going to do for us. We spend our lives trying to become like him. Someday he will take us from the inside and he will make us like him. He will transform us. He will conform us so that we will be like him. And that makes it very easy to understand what John said when he wrote in 1 John 3 and verse 2. We do not yet know what we will be like when he appears, but we know this, that we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We will be like him. And so we need to spend our lives trying to get to know the Lord. We ought to want to know him. I don't mean know about him, but I mean know him. The passage was mentioned earlier from Jeremiah 31 that God said there will come a day that the people will no longer say to their neighbor, Know Jehovah, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. There's the goal of the Christian life, to know Jesus Christ and, and to know God. And you know, if you want to know someone, you want to, to know what is important to them. You begin to love the things that they love. For 10 years before we moved to Oklahoma, I had the privilege of preaching for the university church on the campus of Faulkner University and enjoyed a, a wonderful relationship for 10 years with Brother Winkler, and uh, he helped me so much. But during that time, we had many, many weddings in our church building. It seemed like every year the calendar would, was just filled with weddings. And the students would come in September, and they would schedule our building for a wedding next uh, April or May. Now, they didn't know who they were going to marry yet, but they went ahead and, and um, scheduled the building. I mean, you know, the Lord will provide was their, their attitude about that. But what, I come to, what we came to see as we looked at these students was when they fell in love with someone, they wanted to, to get to know that person. 
They wanted to spend time with them. They wanted to know what was important to them. They began to love the things that that person loved. And all of us understand that. If I love my wife, I love the things that she loves. If I love my parents, I love the things that they love. And if I really want to know the Lord and I love him, I will love the things that he loves. And that brings us to the second thought here. Not only should we seek to know the Lord, but we should seek to know the word of the Lord. And I wish I had much more time to spend on this. But I want to talk about knowing the word of the Lord. We're being told by many today that we can't know the word of the Lord, that we can't have complete knowledge, that, that um, there's so many things that we can't understand, that we, we, can't, we don't have all truth. I confess to you today that I don't know, I don't understand everything about the word of God, but I stand upon every word of it. We must stand upon every word of God. The Bible is filled with verses proclaiming the fact that we can know the will of God. 2 Peter 1.3, His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now watch this. How? Through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue. Jude reminds us that we are to contend earnestly for the faith, the faith which was once and for all time delivered to the saints. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed handling aright the word of truth. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Does it sound like we can't know the word of God? We can know the word of God. There's a passage of Scripture that's crouched in the Old Testament in the book of Ezra, chapter 7 and verse 14. King Artaxerxes has given Ezra the scribe a letter, and he says to him in this letter, I want you to inquire concerning Jerusalem and Judah in regard, now listen to this, in regard to the wisdom of God that you hold in your hand. The wisdom of God. Every time I read from God's Word, I'm reading the wisdom of God. Every time I study from the Word of God, I'm studying the wisdom of God. Every time I preach a sermon from the Word of God, I'm preaching the wisdom of God. And we can, thank God, know His Word. And by the way, did you notice Ezra 7 and verse 11 where Ezra was described as a, uh, as a scribe who was an expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord? Oh, how we need men today who are experts in the words of the commandments of the Lord. And when this seed, the Word of God, is planted in good and honest hearts, it will bring forth fruit. The primary way for Christians to grow spiritually is through the study of the Word of God. That's why it's so vitally important that we teach the Word of God in our Bible classes. That's why it's so important that we preach the Word of God from our pulpits. I believe we have a generation of young people alive right now, and I, I know I can't make a blanket statement, but to a very large measure, who do not know the Word of God. God said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. There are many of you who are older Christians who remember a day when everything that was taught in a Bible class and everything that was preached in the pulpit was preceded by, thus saith the Lord. But you can walk in Bible classes all across our land today and they are studying thus saith Mayberry or thus saith Willow Creek or Saddleback or the denominational leaders of the day. And we need to go back to thus saith the Lord. Brethren, when will we learn that the only way for us to raise a faithful generation of Christians is to teach them the word of God? We must go back and teach God's plan for saving man. We must go back and teach the truth about the establishment of the church. Even though there are many who are claiming otherwise, the church of Christ was not born out of the American Restoration Movement. Amen. The church of Christ was founded on the day of Pentecost when Peter opened the doors of the kingdom of heaven just as Jesus told him that he could. We need to preach the truth about that. We need to preach the truth about the organization of the church, uh, the truth about the worship of the church, the truth about the role of women in the church, the truth about the distinctiveness of the church. If the church of Christ is not distinctive, if we are like all of the other religious groups in our world, we have no reason for existence. And we must teach the truth about fellowship with denominations. And if the church of Jesus Christ is just another denomination, 
As my dear friend Bill Smith likes to say, we're doing a poor job as a denomination. But if we are truly the church of Jesus Christ, let us go back and teach what God's Word says. This past year, I preached a series of sermons entitled, Why Do We Teach the Things That We Do? And we talked about all of those things that we just talked about. One of our ladies came to me and said, why do you teach those things? Why do we need those things? Why are you preaching that here? She said, we don't have a problem with any of those things here. Why are you preaching that? How would you answer that question if somebody asked you, why do you preach those things? Let me give you two or three good reasons. Number one, because of the commandment of God to preach the truth. I charge you in the presence of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I solemnly charge you with all solemnity, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I must confess to you that every time I get up and preach a sermon like this, I stand before God with a holy fear because I must preach the word of God. And woe is unto me if I do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the things that you have heard from me commit the same things, the same, to faithful men who will teach others. You see, if we teach the same things that, that Paul preached and the same things that Timothy preached and the same things that Titus preached and the same things that have been preached by gospel preachers down through the centuries of time, we're not preaching Church of Christ tradition. We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're preaching the whole counsel of God. And so we must preach because of God's command. Secondly, we must do this because of the danger of the times. We're living in difficult times. We're being told that we don't need so much Bible, that we need more preaching on the family and on relationships. And, and I believe those things are important. We ought to talk about those things. We are told we need to preach more on the issues like abortion and homosexuality and, and all of the problems in our world, and, and I'm convinced we need to do that. There's nothing, we, we must preach on those things, but I'm here to tell you this afternoon that the greatest evil in our world is not any of those things. It is not homosexuality. It is not abortion. It is not a failure of the home in America. The greatest evil in our world today is whenever we pervert the word of God. There's the greatest evil in our world. It is said that when Alexander the Great was ruling the world that people were starving, literally thirsting and starving to death. And so he, they would call for him to send ships with food. And, and on a number of occasions, he had a, a leader who would take those ships and instead of putting, putting food and water in those ships, he would put dirt and sand in those ships while the people were starving and thirsting to death. And we are living in a day when people are starving and thirsting for the Word of God. And in many places, they're being fed a steady diet of substitute when what they desperately need is the water that will quench their thirst forever and the bread of life. And let me give you one more reason very quickly why I believe that we must preach these things. It's because of the future of the church. And this is the most practical reason maybe of all. Every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, sitting on my right, about 15 young men ages 10 to 14 years old. They sit on the very front bench. I'm not the second or third, but the very front. Every Sunday morning and every Sunday night. I cannot stand before God in the judgment day having them be seated in those seats and not knowing that the Bible teaches that instrumental music is not pleasing to God. I cannot allow them to sit there and think that it's, you can just be a part of any denominational group you want to out there in the world. I cannot let, allow them to sit there and think that it's okay that if, you're not, if you haven't been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that's okay. We're all brothers in Jesus. And we have nearly 100 teenagers in our congregation, and they're not always going to be with us. Someday they're going to go off to college somewhere, and someday they're going to go off on their own. And I want to make sure that they hear the Word of God. And I'll tell you the most important of all of that is that two of those teenagers are my children. And I have to stand before God someday and give an account of the way that I've taught them. We must preach the Word of God. And then we must seek the lost. Jesus came to the world for the purpose of seeking and saving the lost. Well... I'm almost out of time, and I'm not out of sermon yet, Brother Maxie. 
Uh, by the way, I want to tell you, Brother Max, he preached in Oklahoma City recently at a workshop for preachers, and he did a tremendous job. But I've been thinking about this all the time. They had someone who was holding up cards with how many minutes he had left, and I want you to know he just completely ignored every one of those cards. <laughs> and so I, I'm still debating, Brother Max, whether I'm going to pay attention to this or not. We must seek the lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. I grew up hearing that the work of the church is threefold, benevolence and edification and evangelism. If I understand the Bible correctly, there's only one singular work of the church, and that is to reach out to those who are lost in our world. Now, everything else is important. All of those things are part of that work, but everything that we do must be centered around seeking and saving the lost. Well, finally, knock and the door will be open unto you. Brother Bowles said, knocking at the gate with the urgent importunity which claims admission to the Father's house. Brother Kaufman said, these words are far more than a promise to answer prayer. And if the truth is that this reference has to do with the missions of the Father's house, what it reminds us is that the entrance into the kingdom of God and the entrance into heaven is not by cheap grace. It's true that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's true that we're saved by grace through faith, but it is equally true that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we meet certain conditions. Practically every religious group in our world has some conditions that must be met. Even those who say that we're saved by grace alone without contributing one whit tell us that there are conditions that must be met. I mean, is it not doing something if a person walks down to a mourner's bench? Is that not doing something? Is it not doing something if somebody prays and asks the Lord to come into their life? Is it not doing something if somebody calls on the name of the Lord? It appears to me that the question is not, is there something we must do? But the question is, what is it that we must do? And the answer to that question is the same today as it was when Peter first gave that answer to the people who asked that question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, God forgives us our sins, and he doesn't forgive them before we do that. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Ask, and it will be given unto you. My prayer is that all of us, as we continue to live for God, and we continue to speak his word, will understand all of the great promises that God has given us. And that we will make sure that as we ask, we will understand that our God hears our prayers. And as we seek, that we will understand that our God wants us to seek to know him and to know his word. And he wants us to seek for those who are lost. And as we knock, that we will knock in such a way with an importunity that will allow us to someday be ushered in to that everlasting kingdom that is prepared for those who love him. Thank you very much.